for those who are just tuning in, if you haven't uh, caught the, the last 10 minutes of building the crowd. Uh, my name is John Paul Franke. Uh, John Paul Franke Schlamm is actually the whole name. I got uh, John Paul because my parents loved the Beatles. And uh, I got Franke because my father is German and Franke is a very common German surname. Uh, Stephanie Blanchet, uh, you, you have to come to Prague if you've never been. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful city and if you don't come here, you're, you're missing out. And today I'm going to show you one of the special regions of it. Hagid, hi from Israel. Uh, Anita, hi from Peru, great to have you. Um, and I was getting to the last part of my name, the name Shlam. It's the Jewish side of my family. My mother is Jewish, uh, hence, according to the Jewish tradition, I myself am Jewish, even though I wasn't raised such. Um, I've always been interested in the Jewish part of my family, and so today I'm going to explore just a little bit about uh, Jewish history in general, and I'm going to show you the Jewish quarter of Prague. It's one of the most visited quarters of the city. The history is very famous here, and uh, there's a lot of questions that people have about the Jewish district, so I want you guys to give me questions as we go, and I'll try to preempt a few of the questions. I'll tell you some of the common questions that I get from tourists while we're, um, while we're doing live stream tours. Uh, right now, though, I want to say thanks to everyone who actually uh, came in here to help support this new world of virtual tourism. I've been guiding for seven years in Prague. I love the job, and COVID has absolutely killed it. It's been, uh, it's been a really rough time. Uh, tour guiding was one of the hardest hit industries in the world, so we're trying this uh, new field as kind of a pioneer phase for us. And with the tours we did in the past, uh, the tradition was we would guide everyone around for free. People could leave tips and donations at the end. It's much the same here. If you guys appreciate uh, the info that I've given you and the tour that I've invested my time in, uh, if you think it's fair to give a gift at the end, there's a donation link in the description. Uh, Chris will be posting the link as the tour goes. So that would be fantastic if you guys wanted to give something. If you don't, that's, that's absolutely fine. I'm happy to still interact and answer questions as much as we can. Michaela, hi from Germany. Uh, Kristen Curie, hi from Texas. I've always wanted to see Texas and never got there yet. But uh, let's see, good to know you should... Oh yeah, you should absolutely visit when this is over uh, to Dennis Daniel. All right guys, I'm gonna switch, uh, switch from my face. I'm gonna start showing you some of what's in front of us here. Change to front camera, okay. So now, I am going to back up slightly. We're in the middle of Franz Kafka Square. And I hope everyone knows who Kafka is. If you don't, I'm gonna tell you his story right now. Franz Kafka, is one of the most famous writers in history. And here we see this building. It looks, uh, you know, it, it blends in well with the scenery of Prague. It's not particularly uh, a standout, but it does have some markers that show back in 1883, in this place, Franz Kafka was born. I was talking a little bit before. Uh, Barry Wong, hi from Malaysia. And uh, Thao Nguyen, uh, you wish to visit Prague again? You, you absolutely have to come back. Uh, Prague, it's, it's never going to get old. You can always find something else here. See, here we used to have Cafe Kafka, right behind those windows. Cafe Kafka is shut down now, like many businesses in Prague at the moment. But here, on the corner of this building, is a bit of a nightmarish face of Franz Kafka, placed here in memory of his birth in this building. And um, the, the style is quite appropriate. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about Franz Kafka and what we call Kafkaesque art or Kafkaesque uh, anything really. Franz Kafka, uh, we're gonna move, I'm gonna talk about him as we go. Let's see, uh, you did this, uh, Anita Ruiz, uh, I'm glad you liked the tour, thanks very much. Uh, hope, to, uh, hope to be able to share more with you as we go. Uh, are there Orthodox Jewish communities here? Question from Maria Bioska. Yes, there are uh, Orthodox Jewish communities, but there's nothing compared to what there used to be in the past. The Jewish community is actually one of the oldest communities of Bohemia. Not as old as the Czechs themselves, but the first Jews arrived here all the way back in the 10th century, as far as the records show. Diana Garrity, thanks for coming. Uh, back to uh, Franz Kafka. Now, Franz Kafka, uh, he was born to a German family, but uh, he was born in Prague. And throughout his life, he, uh, 
he wrote books as a hobby. It wasn't actually his job. He was never published in, uh, during his lifetime. And he wrote in a style that I could only describe as being nightmares on paper, like bad dreams. They were really ethereal, metaphoric. They didn't always make sense. But uh, it was a style that he himself appreciated, but didn't think that others would appreciate. He didn't think that we'd understand what he was trying to say through all these strange stories. And uh, Franz Kafka sadly died young. 40 years old, tuberculosis killed him. Uh, he moved to Vienna at the end of his life for rehabilitation. But uh, he, uh, he left his books to his best friend in life, Max Broad, and told him, Max, when I die, I want you to burn everything I've ever written. And Max Broad wouldn't do it. Kafka died and Max Broad published his works. And now Kafka is famous all over the world. He's often required reading in schools. He makes great discussion topics in books. Uh, people always try to delve in and find the meaning. What is Franz Kafka saying? I'm gonna take a moment to pause here and scroll down to the cobblestones. Here, the cobblestones actually make out the shape of one of Prague's most famous legends, the Golem of Prague. Now the Golem in this legend is sort of a big hulking clay man uh, who was brought to life with magic. And uh, I'm gonna get into that story a little bit more. I just wanna show you the, the cobblestone shape. Oh, mom's watching, hi mom. All the way from China, great to have you aboard. Anita Ruiz, uh, you remember the statue with Kafka's head off? Well, okay, slight correction there. It's not Kafka's head that's missing. He's riding on the top of a man whose head is missing. So we'll actually get to that statue. I'll show it to you in a bit. Car driving by. Here we are in the Jewish quarter now. And here we have the first of a number of synagogues that we're going to visit. It is known as the Miso Synagogue. Now I wanna get a little bit into the history of the Jewish Quarter while I talk about this amazing piece of architecture here. Now the Jewish Quarter, it, uh, it really dates back to the 1200s. Uh, before that, the Jews were living freely across Bohemia. I said they've been here since the 10th century, but very early on in Jewish history, they were already suffering persecution from the Christian demographics. And it all got worse in the year 1215, when Pope Innocent III called the Fourth Council of the Lateran. And in this council, it was decided that Jews collectively had to take responsibility for deicide or for the killing of a god. And therefore, it was decided that Jews could not live with Christians. They certainly could not breed with Christians. And they could not work in the same jobs as Christians. They were not allowed to be parts of guilds or craftsmen. And all these impositions were uh, put on the Jews. And uh, all over Europe as well, ghettos began to appear. The Jews had to live in isolation, often behind walls. About, uh, my sister's watching too. Hey, Natalie, great to have you. Thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the Jews all over Europe were, were put in oftentimes terrible conditions. Uh, two centuries later, this was a walled ghetto and the Jews had to live behind these walls, oftentimes in squalor. Now, the conditions of the Jewish quarter oftentimes depended on who was in charge, who was the king at the time. He could make it better, he could make it worse. But uh, this particular synagogue comes from a time that's actually known as the golden age of the Jewish ghetto of Prague. And I'll talk a bit more about this as we go. But uh, the king at the time was Habsburg King Rudolf II. And uh, I think everything's okay, Chris. Not sure why the video is shaking. I'll try to, try to keep it as steady as I can. The gimbal's working fine. But uh, Rudolf II, uh, was a Catholic king who had his own biases and prejudices, but he had seen actually that the Jews were good with money. And he took a prominent Jewish uh, businessman in Prague, his name was Mordecai Meisel, and he made him his minister of finance. Anita Ruiz, that's correct. He's sitting on the shoulders of the headless man. We'll see that statue in a bit. But um, yeah, the, Mordecai Meisel was one of the richest men in Prague at the time, and he invested a lot in the Jewish quarter. He became the mayor of the Jewish quarter, and it flourished during his time, and a lot of beautiful buildings appeared. This is one of them. The, uh, the Meisel Synagogue, named after Mordecai Meisel. Now, it was very different when he first built it in the 16th century. It had a Renaissance facade in those days. Sometime later, in 1689, there was a terrible fire. A huge portion of the Jewish ghetto was decimated. And uh, the synagogue was rebuilt after that, but not 
to its original splendor. It's actually a lot shorter than it used to be. It used to come towards me about one third longer than it is right now. And then late, uh, later, at the end of the uh, 1800s, it was reconstructed yet again in a, a neo-Gothic fashion. Uh, in the last tour, I talked about how you can recognize Gothic buildings, how they often have pointed arches. And here you can actually see, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here, the pointed doors and the pointed roof as we go up and how everything points skyward. And again, that is the Gothic trend. So it has a Baroque, uh, a lot of Baroque decoration on the outside. There you can see the tank mammoths at the top. But this is considered a neo-Gothic building nowadays. And it's not an active synagogue anymore. There aren't that many active synagogues in the Jewish ghetto. Uh, that is because actually there's not a very big Jewish population here anymore. These synagogues were shut down during the Nazis, uh, the Nazis era. And this synagogue actually was used to store a lot of things that the Nazis stole from the Jews in those days. And nowadays, uh, in order to give these things more purpose, they use them as part of the Jewish Museum, which I believe is the second biggest Jewish museum in the world. And we're going to continue strolling down. And while we go, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the history of the Jewish district. So uh, as I was saying before, uh, the, the conditions of the Jewish ghetto could fluctuate depending on who was the king and how tolerant they were towards the Jews. But throughout this period of the Jewish ghetto, I wouldn't say there were any particularly good times. It was always atrocious by modern standards in terms of discrimination against the Jews. And uh, some kings, uh, Wenceslas II and Wenceslas IV, were known even to kidnap Jews and hold them for ransom to raise money. And uh, besides all the social injustices that the Jews were facing back in those days, throw in the fact that this ghetto was not nearly as beautiful as it is today. Today, as you stroll through the streets and you look up here, you're going to find these beautiful decorative facades and incredible buildings from the 20th century. And uh, the, uh, this is all a modern look of the ghetto. If you go back to the past, the, this was the slum town, essentially. The streets were actually raised later. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. But this was a flood zone of Prague. And notoriously, it was a swamp. The river overflowed. The ground would get muggy, which bred vermin and rats. And the conditions were atrocious. And the disease weight was very, very high. And then there's a curfew on the district. The Jews can only leave uh, during certain hours of the day, like the market hours, for example. And then they have to be confined back in the limits of the city here. So this is basically how it was until the end of the, 17, uh, the 1700s. And then finally the Jews were emancipated. We're going to get into their emancipation a little bit later on. But uh, they... They did have to suffer a lot in history. And as much as uh, when I study Czech history, I think that the Czechs were kind of the whipping boys of history. They always had to suffer a lot at the hands of some oppressor. It's nothing compared to what the Jews went through. And that's not just unique to Prague. This is really all over Europe and the, the Holy See, the Papal See, the Pope's Domain. Uh, I was reading about how in the town of Breslau, or what is modern day Wrocław in Poland, uh, when John of Capistrano, uh, Capistrano visited the city, he managed to radicalize the population against the Jews, and all the Jewish elders in that town were burned at the stake, and the rest of the Jews were expulsed. So that's just a picture of what it could be like to live as a Jew uh, back in those days. It was a time of uncertainty. You never knew if your lot was going to improve or decrease overnight, depending on uh, either who the king was or who the the preachers might be back in those days, and who was giving the radical sermons against the Jews, etc. Michel Sandman, hi from Kingston, New York. Great to have you. Uh, Vera and Michaela, thanks for sharing the video. I, I'm glad to get the word around. Thanks so much for your help and assistance. Uh, the rest of you who are watching, if you want to share as well, uh, get this live stream out there. Let people learn a bit about the Jewish quarter of Prague. I'd really appreciate that. Thanks so much. So here we're coming up on another one of our landmarks just around this corner, we're going to start to see that statue that uh, Anita Ruiz, I think uh, that's the one you were talking about, if I'm not mistaken. It's just on this corner here, we're coming up as soon as I cross the road. We're going to start to see it 
there it is. I'm gonna get closer so you guys have a better view. Here we are. This beautiful building behind the statue, that's uh, it's the newest synagogue of the Jewish quarter. We're gonna get to that in a bit. Just have to make it across the street here. And here we have the statue. There we go. All right, so back to Mr. Franz Kafka. Now, it took us a long time to get this guy a statue in this city. This statue was put here in December of 2003, if my memory serves me correctly. Metallic statue. Uh, here at the top is Franz Kafka, and he's sitting on the shoulders of a rather disembodied man. Now, this is from one of Kafka's lesser-known short stories that's known as Depiction of a Struggle. And uh, this book, it's, uh, it's the classic Kafka nightmare. Uh, to describe it a little bit, the narrator uh, meets an acquaintance uh, while at a party, and this acquaintance is a giant empty suit. No head, no hands, no feet. And in the second part of the book, he leaps on the man's shoulders, rides him like a horse, and uh, sort of bends the landscape to his will. He's able to uh, make anything happen on his whim. He tells the man where to go. And this uh, is a throwback to that book, but a lot of you probably haven't read Depiction of a Struggle, so I'm going to refer to a little piece of better-known literature depicted at the feet of the statue. Here, if you look in the cobblestones, you will see the head, antenna, and legs of a beetle. That's the head, here are the antenna, and all around the feet, the black cobblestones, and then the, the metal. The base of the statue is meant to be the beetle's shell. And this is a reference to Kafka's much better known work, The Metamorphosis. The Metamorphosis is a dark, surreal, and somewhat depressing story. Kafka did have a bit of a dark sense of humor about him at times, but uh, it's about a man who wakes up from his sleep to find that he's been transformed into a monstrous vermin, or what is often uh, interpreted as a cockroach. So here, the, the beetle, the, the cockroach, is meant to be the monstrous vermin talked about in the book The Metamorphosis. And we're going to head a little bit more into the Jewish quarter here, leaving Kafka behind. It's actually a very common uh, popular practice for friends to pose in front of the statue while sitting on each other's shoulder, one of them pointing forward just like this. But uh, here we come to our second synagogue. We'll see it better just past the tree here. The Spanish synagogue, as it's called. Now, oftentimes uh, at the Spanish synagogue, I'll ask people, what kind of building do you think this is? And they'll say, it looks like a mosque. And that's true, it does look like a mosque. The style of architecture is Moorish revival architecture, and this was built in 1868. Now, Actually, originally, a long time ago, there stood here the Altschul, what is uh, called the Old School. And it was one of the oldest buildings uh, in the Jewish quarter, but um, it was torn down finally in uh, uh, 1867 to make room for this big construction. Now, why would they build a Jewish place of worship in a style of architecture associated mostly with the Muslim faith? There are clues that it's a synagogue and not a mosque. If I zoom in up here at the top, you will see the icons of the Ten Commandments surrounded by the Jewish Star of David and panning up a little bit more at the tops of these domes. Once again, the Jewish Star of David. Now, they say that it's called the Spanish synagogue because of an incredible gilded stucco inside. That's a throwback to... Uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish architecture from Alhambra in Spain. But uh, they say, hi Lisa Morrison, great to have you, thanks for coming. Lisa Morrison, one of my biggest, uh, biggest fans. I really appreciate your attendance. You're all the way in Australia, so it must be late. Diana Pombo, Franz Kafka is one of your favorite authors. I, I'm afraid I, I actually, 
I don't appreciate him that much, I guess, because I like my books to be like really clear cut and uh, I'd like to have a solid story to follow. But that being said, I really have to appreciate just the uniqueness that Kafka brought to writing and the fact that he was so unique. We invented the word Kafkaesque just as a way to describe this nightmarish style that he wrote in. And Kafkaesque is often used to describe bureau bureaucratic nightmares. But um, Thaun Guyen, thanks very much. I'm glad you find the information useful. Yeah, as I was saying, uh, back in Spain, uh, the kingdom of Al-Andalus was a Moorish kingdom who was actually very good to the Jews. Uh, it's called the Golden Age of the Jews in Spain when these people were in charge. So uh, this building was built in Moorish architecture as a throwback to that Golden Age, that time of harmony between the Jews and the Moors. We're going to continue a little bit this way. And uh, I have a comment from Ryan Egensberger who says, I got to play... Gregor Samsa on stage once. Oh, so you actually played the Metamorphosis. Wow, I wish I could see that production. That would be quite something. Spent lots of time watching YouTube vids of dung beetles. <laughs> yeah, that's good preparation right there. Uh, Diane uh, Garrity, thanks so much for uh, uh, thanks so much for your sharing uh, sharing the video. I really appreciate that. Uh, while we walk, I'm just going to pan up a little bit so you can see kind of the modern day look of the Jewish ghetto. It's a far cry from what it used to be. You would never know that this was a slum town back in the day. Nowadays, uh, the Jewish ghetto is just teeming with beautiful styles of Rococo, uh, Neo-Renaissance, Baroque, Art Nouveau, Art Deco. And one actually very interesting style that is quite unique and it originated in Bohemia, around the corner we're going to get an example of this. Just turning to the left here. Over the side. Here we go. I think we're going to get a fantastic sun glare. There it is. Okay. But as we come to this corner building, I'm going to point out a few of its uh, key architectural features. And we'll see, uh, leave in the comments if anyone can guess from my clues what this style of architecture is called. This building here. Now, it is not the most decorative style of architecture out there. You know, we have much more in-your-face uh, styles like Rococo or uh, Art Nouveau. Those are kind of my favorites. But this style, it is very much associated with a famous artist whose artwork was known kind of in its own right as being a, a strange style that used straight lines, cubes, edges. And you can see here in this building, everything is angular. There's no rounded shapes. Everything comes to a point somewhere. And this is a style of architecture that was only done in Bohemia at first in the early 1900s. I believe 1912, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, is when they started dabbling with this style of art as an architecture style. Now, I wonder if anyone's been able to figure it out. And if you have, you can post it in the comments. And I'm going to get back to that in a bit. I'll leave you guys wondering for now. Over here, we have my least favorite style of architecture. That is a communist building. That also came in the early, uh, sorry, the, the mid uh, 20th century. The communists were here from, uh, well, they were in power here, rather, from 1948 until 1989. 41 years of Soviet reign of terror in Czechoslovakia. Uh, they left a bunch of horrible apartments. Most of them are on the edge of town. Thankfully, they didn't mark too much of the beautiful city center. Well, that's one example. It's actually nice as far as communist buildings go. It's better on the inside. It's not to take anything away from the luxury of the Intercontinental Hotel. But since I haven't gotten any comments yet on what the style of architecture might be, that is called Cubism. And the most famous name associated with Cubism, the artist I was talking about, uh, Alexa VP, it is not brutalism, as I was saying. No, it's Cubism. Good try, though. Very nice try. Well, the style of art uh, is best associated with Pablo Picasso, the, the famous Cubist painter. 
and we're going to take a look over here. I wonder if we can see something at the top of this hill here. If we can't, then I'll just skip right over it, but there's something very interesting up here that I'd like to share with you guys. Oh, it's tiny. It's a dot in the distance. I'm going to see if I can zoom in and give you guys a better view. There we are. Okay, so at the top of the hill, you can see that rod moving back and forth on top of a pyramid. It's a giant metronome sitting on top of Letna Park. Now, that metronome represents the time lost under the communist regime. And it's actually standing in the spot where they used to have the largest statue in the world of Joseph Stalin. I believe the statue was 15 and a half meters tall and it was sitting up there overlooking Prague, Stalin's brothers at his back. And then that statue, of course, the legacy of Stalin deteriorated after his death. And even back in Russia, he was known as this horrible dictator who just murdered millions of people. And so it was taken down by means of, I believe, 600 kilos of dynamite, uh, some sources have quoted. The first blast of dynamite blasted off his head. It rolled down the hill, landed in the river, and was left there to rot in the mud. And the rest of his body was blown to smithereens. But uh, here, I'm going to turn us to a very elaborate and expensive street as soon as I've zoomed out here. There we go. Okay, now panning over this way. This is one of the most expensive streets in Europe. Right here. It resembles a wide Paris boulevard. It has trees on the other side. Uh, it's a nice wide road and it has some of the fanciest buildings in, in the whole city. This is Street Parzyska, which loosely translated is Paris Street. Now, Paris Street is where you'd go shopping, or at least where you would used to go shopping before the COVID pandemic, for Gucci and Rolex and Prada, uh, all the highest end name brands. This is a much more desirable part of town nowadays. After the reconstruction of the Jewish ghetto, this became the prime real estate. So close to the city center, beautiful views, all renovated. Diana, Michelle, and Ryan all guessed cubism, but a moment too late. Oh, good good on you guys. Diana, Michelle, and Ryan, props to you for guessing cubism. Well done. I, I didn't see the comments in time. But uh, fantastic guess. You're spot on. Absolutely right. All right. So back to Street Parzyska. Now, the Jewish ghetto uh, was as I said before, torn down and then reconstructed. And the purpose was to actually remodel Prague in the style of Paris. Hence, this is Paris Street. And there's a lot of styles here that are meant to kind of reflect the streets of Paris. We have a lot of French Art Nouveau in the area. And also one of my favorite buildings, House Number 98 is absolutely spectacular. I hope I can bring that across on camera. I'll have to get through these trees to really show you. But this building here, this is a wonderful work of art this building. Now, as far as the records I could find show, this building was built in 1907, and that was uh, just during the, the big reconstruction phase of Prague. It's known as the, uh, the old synagogue restaurant down here. Here's a, a popular but expensive eatery with a very beautiful mosaic marking the top. This building combines Art Nouveau with Gothic, and I think the marriage of those two styles is absolutely spectacular. I'll just give a slow pan up here. There we go. So you have the, the, beautiful, uh, the beautiful decoration of Art Nouveau combined with that uh, ominous feel of Gothic. There at the roof you see the Gothic spires pointing upwards, and they even colored the building dark, which I think is a throwback to that Gothic, uh, Gothic image of having dark walls that have been uh, polluted by, by dust and uh, soot from the air. It really soaks into the sandstone of Gothic. Rebecca Drysdale, it is a lovely street, but it's not a place I'd really recommend going shopping unless you come loaded with money to burn. Like I saw, I was looking at the, the prices in the uh in the the shops and one dress that was in the window costs like seven times my monthly rent it's crazy but uh here with this nice 
sunset image in the back. We come to a, a little passage road. It's, it's a street known as Chervena. And I haven't been able to confirm where the name Chervena comes from, but Chervena in Czech means red street. You can see it written up here on the corner. And from what I've heard, that is a reference to a horrible pogrom that happened some time ago. Uh, pogroms, for those who haven't heard, are riots that are against a group of people, oftentimes anti-Semitic riots. And they say that this particular pogrom left for a very long time stains of blood on the walls of this synagogue here, hence the name Red Street. But there's a lot of interesting buildings just kind of tucked in right here. Uh, for example, in between the beautiful Art Nouveau building and this, uh, this fancy Rococo building, which I'll get to in a moment, is a 16th century Renaissance synagogue placed high above street level. And that height could possibly be why it is known as the High Synagogue. Uh, this synagogue was actually modeled after another synagogue known as High Synagogue in Poland, in Krakow, if I remember correctly. It was uh, built by Mordecai Meisel, the, the same man who built the Meisel Synagogue, the first one that we saw earlier. And it was the synagogue for the, uh, the, court, the Jewish court. So the, the people who ran the district would have their prayers, services, and meetings up in those rooms. And right next to it, this building, it was also sponsored by Mordecai Meisel. And it was originally built in Renaissance. So back in those days, it might have actually more closely resembled the high synagogue. But uh, sometime later, they recast it in Baroque Rococo style. And Rococo, right alongside Art Nouveau, is one of my favorite art styles in the world. It's, uh, it gets a lot fancier than this. If you guys are on Google, pop over there, look up Rococo art, you're gonna see some absolutely mind-blowing stuff. Um, one of my favorite Rococo buildings in Prague is the Archbishop's Palace near the Prague Castle. It could be incredibly decorative. But uh, here, at the top of this building, is something interesting to note. A Hebrew clock with Hebrew letters. Now in contrast, here is a Roman numeral clock and you're gonna notice the hands of these two clocks are in different positions. This one actually goes counterclockwise because Hebrew uh, language, unlike, Jew uh, unlike English language, is written from right to left. And therefore, the clock actually goes backwards because to us, the Jews read backwards. I mean, of course, to them, we read backwards. But uh, coming back to the synagogue on the side. Now, this is the oldest synagogue in the Jewish ghetto right now. So I'm getting a bit of a slant on my gimbal there. Let's see if I can fix that. There we go. I'm gonna zoom out a bit. Here we go, walk backwards. This building is known as the Old New Synagogue. Now, it's not new, it's definitely old. Uh, different sources put the building of this uh, the synagogue between 1270 to 1280. Now, for historic context, that's the era of Marco Polo. So we're talking very ancient history here. But uh, the Spanish, uh, sorry, the Old New Synagogue, we're not entirely sure where it gets its name. There's different stories associated with it. Some people say that um, when it was first built, it was called the Old Synagogue. And, uh, sorry, it was called the New Synagogue because in those days it was new. And then as time passed, it stopped being new. And so they updated it to the old new synagogue. There's a bit more depth to that story, but uh, some others say that uh, back in the day, this building was called the Alt-Nai Synagogue. Alt-Nai is Hebrew for on condition because uh, allegedly uh, materials of this, <clears throat> sorry, materials of this uh, synagogue's foundation came from Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And uh, the, uh, the stones were allegedly lent to Bohemia on condition that they be sent back to the Holy Land when the Messiah comes. And therefore it was called the On Condition or alt Nai Synagogue. But um, the, uh, the name alt Nai sounds a lot like the German alt Neu, And German became a very dominant language in Bohemia after the Thirty Year War. So there was this mistranslation, 
Alt Nai becoming Alt Noi, and hence this becoming the Old New Synagogue. But uh, this is where the legend of the golem originates from. I was talking about the golem earlier, the mythical clay creature. And this goes back to the day of Rudolf II. Now, Rudolf II was the king who appointed Mordecai Meisel to office. And uh, he was into some very strange sciences, alchemy, astrology, but more tolerant towards the Jews. And uh, they say during this time, it was kind of the era of magic in Prague. And, uh, Rabbi Lo, the man in charge of the synagogue in those days, used the magic of Kabbalism to form a big clay man with mud from the Voltava River. And he took a piece of paper with magic Hebrew words, and some sources say he put it in the golem's forehead, some say in the mouth. But in either case, the golem came to life, and he was the protector of the Jewish ghetto, defending them from violent riots and pogroms. And uh, the, the golem only had to have one day off per week, the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day of rest. The rabbi always had to deactivate him, but the one Sabbath he forgot, the golem went berserk and went on a rampage around Prague. And the, go the rabbi quickly had to jump on him, tear the word from him, and he was deactivated. And they say afterwards, stored in the attic of the old new synagogue. Now, of course, it's not uh, permitted to enter the attic, but they did do reconstruction up there. They found nothing. So it's possible, rather, that the golem is integrated to the walls of the synagogue, some sources would say. But a little interesting fact, some trivia. Uh, they say that Rabbi Lo found out about the golem's rampage while reading Psalm 92 uh, during service in the synagogue. So actually today, there is uh, a tradition where Psalm 92 is read twice in this synagogue because the rabbi had to interrupt Psalm 92 and then read it again upon his return. And now we're panning this way. Now here, down this street, we have some buildings of note. Uh, this one at the end is a little bit deceptive. I'm gonna zoom in here. You see, this looks like a very old Romanesque building, which if it was a true Romanesque, it would put it between the 10th to the 12th century, perhaps in Prague. Actually, that building was built in 1912 or 1910, one of those years. And it's the Jewish ceremonial hall. It's neo-Romanesque. Uh, so uh, not nearly as old as it's meant to look, but it's a great throwback to how things might have looked very, uh, very long ago in the early days of the Jewish settlements. And this white building is the Clausen Synagogue. Now, Clausen means enclosure, and it was a, an enclosure that had a Talmudic school and a temple for worship in the days of Mordecai Meisel, but then after the fire of 1689, it was restored uh, with its current facade, and... Uh, now it's just named the enclosure because of the enclosure that used to be here. But it's right next to the Jewish cemetery. And thankfully, this gimbal can look up higher than I can. So I'm going to try to show you what's above that wall there. Let's see. There it is. You can see the tombstones of the cemetery. But one thing of note is that it's quite high above street level. Let's see. Alba Leon, Prague is on your bucket list. Uh, that's, that's a good decision. I really hope the board is open soon so that people can start coming again and just enjoying the splendor of Prague. Uh, see this wall in front of the cemetery. It usually has a, a Jewish market that sells all kinds of souvenirs and gizmos. That's all closed now. Are the synagogues open for worship during COVID? Uh, Nikki Oldroyd, that's a very good question. Uh, I know that the churches in Prague are not, so it's my assumption that the synagogues are not either. Uh, the Old New Synagogue is the only one here that's actually regularly active for Jewish services, but I don't think they have any happening at the moment. I could be wrong about that, but um, I don't think they would close the churches and make a special exception for the Jewish, uh, the Jewish community. But uh, back to the, the, the Jewish cemetery here. Now, the Jewish cemetery is a burial ground that the Jews used as far back as the 1400s. And you see, if you're Jewish, you have to bury the dead. That's a tradition that goes way back in Jewish history. And uh, there's, there's different reasons for it. 
The most important one being, though, that when the Messiah comes, the dead will rise from the grave and be brought back to life. So you have to be in the grave, and therefore it's not permitted as a Jew to cremate your dead or bury them at sea. And that's one of the, the extra atrocities that the Nazis committed on the Jews during the Holocaust. They forced them to burn their dead and operate crematoriums at places like Terezin, a concentration camp in the north of Czechoslovakia. But uh, back in the days of the ghetto, they had very limited space in which to bury their dead. The Christians gave them this one cemetery, and then it got full. And they couldn't actually get permission for another cemetery from the authorities of Prague. So they began to stack their graves on top of each other, and they raised the level of the cemetery as they went. So now, this is actually 12 layers of graves stacked on top of each other. You'll notice that the tombstones don't really have much order to them. They're quite crowded, quite messy. There's uh, 20,000 tombstones just jammed in wherever they could find room. Many of those tombstones have multiple names. And they estimate that there are 100 or 110,000 people buried in the cemetery here. And the cemetery is usually open for the public as part of the Jewish museum. So that's something that I'm, I'm hoping reopens again. The Jewish Museum is a fantastic way to learn more about the Jewish history of Prague. Uh, so when that reopens and you guys manage to come, I definitely recommend going to the Jewish Museum. Put that on your list of things to visit when you make it here again. And we're going to head around the corner to our next synagogue. But uh, let me see, I'll, I'll catch up on the comments as I go in the meantime. Oh, Irena, thanks so much for sharing the live stream. I appreciate that. I'm glad you enjoy it enough to uh, get the word out there. Thanks a million. <clears throat> There's something interesting coming up in a, a doorway here. And I'll try to explain what that is right over here. I wonder if anyone has seen the movie Ben-Hur, not the, not the watered-down remake, the original with uh, Charlton Heston. Because in that movie, it's quite common, uh, it shows a common practice of the Jews. Charlton Heston goes in and out of the, the door of his house. He'll always touch his fingers to something and then put those fingers to his lips. And here's a modern uh, representation of that old practice. This is called a mezuzah. Now, a mezuzah is a box in a Jewish doorway containing uh, papers or parchment that are known as a cloth that contain verses from the book of Deuteronomy in the Pentateuch, or what we would call the Old Testament, or the first five books of the Old Testament specifically. And uh, these verses describe sort of a covenant between God and the Jews saying, if you, if you don't do this, if you don't pursue false gods, then I will see to it that your crops grow. And I'll see to it that you don't suffer, uh, uh, suffer disasters. And then at the end, it says to actually put these verses in your doorways. So the Jews have done just that. And it's a tradition spanning across basically every country that has a Jewish culture. The Jews will enter, touch that, uh, that box, and kiss the fingers that touched it. Michaela. I've been to Prague 20 years ago, trying to find something familiar. Uh, well, 20 years ago, Mikhaila, that's quite a long time to have not been to Prague. I, I, I think you should come back. Really, I do. There's so much that's worth revisiting. Uh, if none of this is familiar, maybe watch the previous live stream I did, uh, the Old Town Square that covers some of the more recognizable highlights of Prague. You might recognize something from that. Uh, oh, fantastic question here from Fernando Cisneros. Uh, Fernando, I, I will answer your question in just a moment. First, I want to show you guys something else right here down in the streets. These markers that mark the silver line, if you can read that. There it is. A silver line. Now, the silver line markers in the streets of Prague, they follow the route that kings would take ever since the coronation of George of Podibradi in the 15th century. Uh, they would start at the Powder Tower at the edge of the old town and then march through a series of streets uh, that nowadays make actually a great walking route to appreciate the architecture of Prague. But it was a tradition for the people to come out and greet their monarch during this procession. And it would lead all the way up to Prague Castle. And then finally, the coronation service would... Uh, 
would take place in the St. Vitus Cathedral. But Ferdinand, uh, for, uh, sorry, Fernando, back to your question. Fernando Cisner asks, do you know why people leave a stone on top of the tombstones? Well, I might know the answer to that question. Again, it's one of those questions that I've heard so many answers to. But I think the, the best answer I've heard for it is that a long time ago, Jews were the wanderers of Europe. In fact, uh, in the biblical times, basically, to be Jewish meant to not have a country. Uh, it was only a concept of the, the Zionists, I think, to, to actually have a solid, physical Jewish nation of Israel. Before that, Israel was thought of as a heavenly state only. Uh, so the Jews were meant to be the wanderers of the world. And they, uh, they would bury their dead in the side of the road as they traveled. And animals began digging up the bodies of the dead. And so, as a measure against this, the Jews would cover the graves in rocks. And any Jewish traveler who passed by the grave later would add a rock to it. And then later it became a tradition just to add smaller stones to the cemetery. Now they leave them there as a token of respect, the same way in uh, some cultures we leave flowers on tombstones. But uh, here we're going down to the streets again. And here we have two... I believe brass, or possibly bronze, plaques. Now, I wonder if people know the story of uh, Gunther Demnig and the, the Stoplerstein, or as they're called, stumble stones in English. You're going to find these in many, many cities across Europe. These are commemorations of Holocaust victims, most of whom are Jewish, but not all. There's also... Uh, there's also markers and stones that commemorate uh, homosexuals, resistance members, political opponents of the Nazis who were murdered in the concentration camps. Diana Gergity, I'm glad you enjoy the history. Uh, really, it's actually, there's so much more I could give. I'm trying to tell you all in about one hour the, the history of the city. It's an incredible place. I'd really love to get more into it. But... Um, yeah, it started back in 1996, this project. So about 25 years ago, uh, Gunther Demnick began placing these memorial plaques in front of buildings where Nazi Holocaust victims used to live. And usually they'd be printed out in the local language, in this case in Czech, but these are the exception to that rule. These are in English. And if you can read that, uh, if, if you can't, I'll help. It says, in loving memory of Karl Mahler, born 1920, Cruelly murdered by the Nazis in Auschwitz, 1942. So that's quite, uh, that's the usual layout for these things. They will give the name of the victim. They will tell, uh, some of them are actually not murdered. Some of them just persecuted and deported to concentration camps. But um, it shows where they used to live. And they call them stumble stones because there's not many maps to actually mark where they are. So people just stumble across them while strolling across the streets. And who pays for them actually varies. Uh, usually they're sponsored by the, 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 the people who run the city, but sometimes also it's the responsibility of the landowners, the people who own the building now, to pay for the installation of those things in the streets. And I believe as of 2019, they reported that there's over 70,000 of those things scattered all across Europe. Stolperstein, that's absolutely correct, Eddie. <clears throat> uh, Mat Matias Rodriguez, thank you very much. I I'm glad you you're enjoying the tour. Uh, there's a few more things to show you before it's over. Here we're coming up on the Pinkhas Synagogue. Uh, Natalie, uh, I miss having you here. Actually, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's. You know, I miss you living so far away, all the way in China. Uh, Jill Bellis, like on the streets of Rome, absolutely correct. All right, here we have the uh, Pinkas Synagogue. Now, the Pinkas Synagogue, it was originally a smaller synagogue in the 15th century, uh, built by Rabbi Pinkas, and then it was expanded in the 16th century into what you see today. Now, it's another building that... Uh, isn't much used nowadays for Jewish services, but it's part of the Jewish Museum, and they use it to commemorate the ho uh, victims of the Holocaust. And there's some very beautiful memorials inside. Uh, Fernando Cisneros, I'm, I'm glad you liked the answer. It's uh, again like that's one possible 
uh, interpretation. One thing I've learned from guiding is that history is not a consensus. Uh, there's usually so many different interpretations of different traditions, and sometimes what's called historic fact really boils down to historic legend. But I think that is the best answer that I've heard, so I'm glad you're happy with the answer. Thanks very much. It's getting a little closer here. Star of David, the window, and then the lower levels. This kind of shows you how the streets of Prague used to be lower. Remember how I said that there was a big flood zone in Prague in the past, and then the streets were kind of raised to uh, prevent flooding. There's actually a lot of buildings around Prague that have deep basements that used to just be street level in those days. So sometimes you'll see windows underground and hubs and taverns. But anyways, getting back to the uh, Finca Synagogue and the memorials inside. Uh, in the main room, there's a memorial of Jewish Holocaust victims from Prague. Uh, over 77,000 names inside. And uh, most of these people were deported to the horrible Nazi concentration camp Terezin, which, as I said before, is the northeast of former Czechoslovakia. And from Terezin, there is actually an art collection. Sorry. An art collection that came from... Uh, was uh, Friedel Dicke Brandis, that's right, a Jewish prisoner in Theresien who was sent there with her husband, who was a, a teacher before, and she opened up an art class for the children of Theresien as a means of therapy for them. And she would have them draw different pictures, sometimes depicting the, the horrors of their reality and the suffering that they were experiencing in Theresien, and then she would tell them to destroy those drawings, and then she'd have them draw positive drawings and memories of their past and something to cling on to to give them hope and joy again and she collected that art from the class and she was later murdered in Auschwitz but her husband who was a Holocaust survivor managed to reclaim the uh, art collection from Theresien after its liberation and the drawings were brought back to Prague and donated to the Pinkas, uh, Pinkas Synagogue and they, they managed to survive the communist occupation, even though the exhibition was closed during that time. Uh, the basement of the synagogue was flooded later, but the drawings survived because they were kept upstairs, and now they're, they're back on display. Uh, there's a rotating exhibition. Sometimes uh, certain uh, parts of the collection go to Israel and then come back, but there's always something to see in there. So that's one thing I'd say you should really visit uh, if, you're, if you have the stomach for Holocaust history. I know that some people don't and they want to avoid the Holocaust museums and it's just too, too dark for some to stomach, but for those who can actually uh, stand to go in there and see it, it's, it's a very beautiful and bittersweet exhibition of one of the most horrible times of human history. Now we're starting to get to the end here, but uh, there's some great views to see. I just want to get us to the riverbank. I want to talk about this beautiful work of Neo-Renaissance to the side before I sign off. And before, uh, before we start getting ready to leave, I just want to say thanks to everyone who, uh, who participated in this. It was great to have you all. I really enjoyed uh, showing you around the Jewish district. But stick around, there's a few more things. And, uh, start thinking about your last minute questions at this point. Anything else you wonder about, uh, anything that I haven't talked about that you want to know about. I'm getting ready to cross the street here. Uh, so, while we're getting to the end, maybe the last 10 minutes of the tour, please uh, hit me with your comments, hit me with your questions, let me know how you think I did so far. I, I'm really uh, curious to know how I'm doing as in this new world of live streaming tours and virtual tours. And... Also, a special thanks to the, uh, the people who have contributed uh, uh, financially to help uh, keep this project running and the, the the people who shared this video to help get the word out you're you're wonderful thank you so much for doing that all the people who left comments uh, it's great because uh, that gives me the feel of having the crowd here I, I really miss touring with the crowd in front of me so thanks for being interactive and helping make uh, this a more personal experience for you and helping to challenge me and keep it interactive that's great. You guys help make this a really enjoyable experience. I want to say thanks to all of you for that. Here we have this fantastic view of the sun just setting behind Prague Castle in the distance. That is some awesome scenery. I wish you guys could be here to enjoy it in person. Jan Palak Square. That's correct, Alexa VP. Jan Palak Square. Um, 
the, uh, yeah, Jan Palach. There might be time to talk about him while we're here, actually. But first, let me just pan over here. That's the castle in the distance. And over here, we have one of the most magnificent examples of neo-Renaissance architecture in Prague, the Rudolfinum, named for heir apparent of the Habsburgs, Rudolf, in the 1800s. And uh, this building, it was built to be a concert hall and art gallery, which it still is to this day. Uh, some sources brag that it has the second best acoustics in the world in the main hall, Dvorak Hall. I cannot uh, say whether that's true or not. It's, it's very hard to judge which building has the best acoustics. But uh, Jill Bellis, thank you. I'm really glad you enjoyed the tour. Thanks so much for coming and commenting and thanks for being a part of it. Thank you very much, Nikki Oldroyd. It's, it's great to have you. Uh, the Czech flag, <laughs> that's a nice touch. Thanks very much for being here. Now, uh, this building has tributes to many famous composers there lining the top. And there's a story you're going to hear in Prague. It's often told as fact. But I, I want to make something clear. This story is not fact, it's fiction. It's still a great story. Vera Juraleva, thanks so much. I'm, I'm really glad you're appreciating the tour. But uh, there's a story that says, during the reign of the Nazis in Prague, Reinhard Heydrich, who was one of the most uh, high-ranking officers the Nazis had, also one of the most horrible men in the, in the regime, the mastermind of the Holocaust, who was later assassinated by the Czechs in Prague, uh, he was furious that this, his favorite concert hall, he himself being an accomplished violinist, uh, he was furious that the, uh, the roof sported an image of Felix Mendelssohn, the Jewish composer, and he ordered some of his men to go up there, find the statue, and tear it down. Diana Pombo, thanks so much for contributing. That's very, very kind of you. You really are uh, a lifesaver in a difficult time. And thanks so much for, uh, for contributing to support this cause. Uh, Ryan Egensberger, I, I don't have Venmo, unfortunately. Uh, I think Venmo doesn't work outside of the United States. At least that's what I've heard. If it does, then I really need to get it. And uh, yeah, so back to the story of Felix Mendelssohn. Uh, Mendelssohn... Uh, yeah, the, some men, uh, eager to please Reinhard Heydrich, scurried on up to the roof of this building, and they couldn't find Mendelssohn. They had no idea which one he was, because none of those statues are marked. So they decided to use a foolproof method. If he's the Jewish composer, he must have the biggest nose. So they went around measuring the noses of the statues. And when they found the biggest one, they tossed him off and uh, shattered his image below. But uh, it turns out that they'd actually thrown off uh, Richard Wagner, who was Hitler's favorite composer. And again, that's a piece of fiction from a book called Mendelssohn is on the Roof. The story is often told as historic fact. It's not, but it's hilarious because it's just parroting the Nazi stereotypes. And it's, it's almost believable that it could have happened. But uh, as to the square itself, Jan Palach Square is named after a student who used to study just across the road. I'm going to do a slow pan around so you get the full view of it. He studied here, and there's actually a picture of his face on this building. This is an extension of the Charles University, and Jan Palach, at the age of 20, in 1969, at uh, the peak of communist oppression in Czechoslovakia, went to the top of Wenceslas Square with a bucket of gasoline, which he doused himself with, and then lit himself on fire as a form of protest, trying to... Uh, rally the, the Czechs and awaken a spirit of revolution in them to bring about the revolution against communism. Sadly, that revolution didn't actually happen during his lifetime. It took another 20 years for it. Uh, I mean, not during his life, but it didn't happen immediately after his death. It took 20 years for the Velvet Revolution to come true, but still, he started something big. He lit the fires, and actually, uh, the impact of what he did was felt all around the world. Student uprisings it happened in America, inspired by Jan Palach. And uh, even though his mission took 20 years to accomplish, he's still recognized as one of the, the great Czech heroes and patriots of his day. And the square is dedicated to him. Laura Flores, I'm so glad you enjoyed the tour. Thank you so much. And Mom, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for leaving comments. And uh, thanks to everyone who participated in this today. The time is just about 7 o'clock. I'd say that's the perfect time to sign off. 
I will leave you with this fantastic view of the castle and the sunset, and I'm gonna face you. Again. Here I am. So guys, this has been great. I really enjoyed uh, taking you around the, the Jewish district of Prague, and thanks to everyone who uh, supported the work, and thanks to everyone who just came along for the ride. It's great to have all of you. Uh, please keep sharing this. Uh, if you, if you want to get the word out there, if you want virtual tourism to catch on, thanks, uh, thanks to those who have already done so. And, uh, before, uh, before leaving, I just want to say that, uh, you can follow me and some of the work that I do on my Facebook page, Pragmatism. It's a blog that I never really got off its feet, unfortunately. I want to start working on it again. It's just gonna, I'm going to need to find some of the budget to actually get those videos made again. But uh, it's a blog that where I just want to share tidbits about Prague, uh, fun facts, top 10 sites, top 10 things to do, top 10 whatevers, and uh, show specific areas of battles, take you through military history walkthroughs and medieval histories walkthrough, answer questions that I get, etc. Lisa Morrison, your dad played at this concert hall. No, no kidding. He played in the Rudolf Finham. That's amazing. Was was he a member of the Philharmonic then? Because uh, this is actually the home of the Philharmonic in Prague, even though it does host other orchestras. Natalie, great to see you back in action. Thanks so much. I I, I will do more. This is not my last virtual tour. Um, not sure if. Uh, if I'm going to stay in Prague in the long haul, but I definitely want to do more of these before uh, before long. And uh, The castle's closed right now, otherwise today might have actually been a tour of the Prague castle. I'm hoping it opens soon. Our state of emergency ends tomorrow. Diane Pombo, good evening. Thanks so much. Uh, sayonara. But yeah, the, I think if the castle opens, that is the next tour I'm going to do. Take everyone around the castle, show you guys the seat of Czech kings, Holy Roman emperors, archbishops, the royalty of Prague, the royal side. That's one of the most amazing sites of it. You know, people are starting to say nowadays, don't go to the castle. Don't listen to them. They are Philistines. The Prague castle is beautiful, it is magnificent, and it has incredible history to it. Thanks, Michaela. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And everyone, I'm starting to head home now. But I want to say thank you again, and I wish you all a happy remaining weekend. Have a great next week, and until I see you next time on the next tour, whatever it may be, uh, keep leaving your comments if you want to leave some feedback or t say what you'd like to see in Prague for the next tour, etc. Until then, hasta la vista. Thanks everyone so much. Here we go.